generating movement? What, what uh, is the sequence of systems that are interacting? Well, you've got a neural command. We've talked about the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And you end up having to think about uh, then the muscles contracting, and they pull on tendons, and then that leads to questions about musculoskeletal geometry. What are the moments around a joint? What are the forces and the opposing forces that are, are at play? And then to really understand things, you have to think about multi-joint dynamics. Nothing makes sense uh, in isolation. A single joint doesn't tell you how someone walks or fails to walk normally. And all that uh, uh, brings uh, you to your final uh, uh, movement. So it's incredibly complicated. Even though at its very simple level, you've just got twitches. If you take a, a muscle, you isolate it, you give it a shock, you see force generation. Okay, we'll talk about how that happens and how it goes wrong. Some interesting temporal dynamics already with that very simple thing. If you start to move your shocks close together, they can uh, uh, summate. You can actually see that a muscle can generate more force if you group two stimuli close together. And in fact, if you carry that out uh, to the limit, you get what's called uh, tetanus. So you get uh, summating force generation that ends up, uh, usually with about 30 hertz activity, gives you a smooth maximal force generation for, for a muscle. And it, can be up to about four times the, the peak force of an individual contraction. So all kinds of interesting uh, biochemistry going on that underlies uh, uh, that process, and we'll talk about that. And that lies at the level of the muscle and the muscle tendon dynamics. Much like nerves, there's sequential levels of organization in the muscle. There are individual uh, muscle cells, uh, but they're bundled together in this uh, hierarchical uh, pattern. Um, a single muscle uh, uh, fiber uh, on this very fine spatial scale called the sarcomere, two to three microns. Uh, this is uh, corresponding to an individual muscle cell and it has many filaments within it that have or overlapping actin and myosin uh, proteins that generate force. We'll talk about how that works. Those cells are bundled together uh, and into fascicles and then those fascicles are in turn bundled together into uh, skeletal muscles. Um, the actin and myosin actually generate the force, and this sarcoplasmic reticulum entity, this is a calcium-containing intracellular membrane compartment. It's like a little bundle of calcium ions inside cells. It's triggered to release its calcium upon the appropriate stimulation uh, from the nerve, and that calcium triggers muscle contraction through a sequence of steps uh, that we'll talk about. So you've got this actin, and you've got this uh, uh, multiple uh, myosin uh, uh, component system. Um, the protein actin, it's about a 43 kilodalton uh, protein, and it, it is constituting these uh, so called uh, thin filaments, uh, which are actin plus a couple of calcium sensors, troponin and tropomyosin. Then uh, uh, you've got uh, this uh, array of other uh, very large proteins as well that together make up uh, some of the rest of the, the filament. This interesting sort of spring-like protein called Titan, it's one of the biggest uh, uh, proteins in the, in the body, and it, it acts like a sort of a damper. It counteracts passive stretching of muscle. But the actual force, the power stroke is generated at the actin-myosin linkage, and a single molecule generates uh, one to two uh, piconewtons. And this process is pretty interesting. I'll see if I can play this uh, movie. Okay. So what you see here, there's a few different components. There's the um, uh, actin helix, which is these uh, uh, collection of spherules. You've got this uh, tropomyosin and troponin complex in the magenta and blue. That has to move out of the way to allow the uh, myosin and, and actin to interact. And that uh, is enabled by calcium. The calcium, this little yellow ion, is going to float in and is going to enable this uh, uh, to move aside and allow the interaction of the uh, myosin and actin, as you can see there. The old yellow thing comes in and allows the space to be created. The purple entity moves aside, and you can interact. Now, you've got other things, too. It's ATP dependent, and so you've got a whole ATP that has to come in, and it's going to get split into an ADP and a phosphate, and you can see that ha happening as well, and that's a magnesium-dependent event, and so you can see the uh, magnesium enabling that and creating, for that brief moment when this thing turns orange, you've got an activated uh, protein myosin complex that can execute this uh, one to two piconewton uh, power stroke and uh, drag the actin filament back. So it's a beautifully orchestrated uh, sequence of events. 
And another way to visualize this in, uh, at the next scale up is to see these, this creates a system where filaments uh, slide against each other. And this corresponds to muscle shortening during the uh, elevation of uh, incoming neural signals. Uh, the muscle contracts and it does that by sliding filaments over each other, retaining its basic structure, but uh, uh, compacting in, in size, okay? So let's do a little, little test on this. Uh, this is depolarization of the muscle by an action potential causes release of calcium ions by the SR, triggering a phenomenon termed excitation contraction coupling. Calcium facilitates muscle contraction by hydrolyzing the ATP attached to myosin, binding to troponin, which leads to conformational change and moves tropomyosin out of the way, participating in the cross bridges formed by actin and myosin. Set in vote your conscience. And very good. So you can see here, uh, answer two, nobody picked three. Uh, it's binding to the and moves that magenta thing out of the way and allows the contraction to happen. Good. By the way, the troponin, uh, if this is also relevant to cardiac muscle as well as to skeletal muscle, and, and you actually have um, uh, a uh, loss of troponin into the blood, that's one way you can detect heart attacks is uh, damage to heart muscle leads to release of troponin. Actually, that's one of the most sensitive uh, current tests for uh, a cardiac uh, arrest, a cardiac uh, ischemic uh, heart attack. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about musculoskeletal uh, geometry now. Um, and here, uh, some simple calculations that can help you understand uh, the um, uh, concept of moments and balanced opposing forces that explain the mechanical disadvantage that most uh, muscles find themselves at. So uh, this is your biceps. Uh, there's an origin and an insertion point, and this kind of makes the mechanical disadvantage uh, point clear right away. The insertion of your biceps, of course, it's very close to the joint. If it, if it attached out here, that would seem to be much more uh, efficient. It would certainly be the case that it would need to execute less force to counteract a, a weight. But of course, that would create anatomical problems. You don't want your biceps to be uh, spanning your arm like that. So you've got these anatomical constraints uh, that put your muscles at a mechanical disadvantage. Exactly uh, how big an effect is that? Well, you can, you can calculate it. So a few things to keep in mind, uh, you kind of see things uh, in the balanced state, the equilibrium state, and that helps you understand, first of all, the sum of forces and also the sum of moments around the joint equals zero in the, in the stable case. So the simple forces, uh, the weight coming down, let's say you've got a, a 10 Newton weight, that's got to be balanced by the uh, Y component of the force the muscles generated, okay? So the, the weight minus the Y component of the muscle but the, uh, if you're not actively uh, rotating or moving the joint, the moments around uh, the joint have to be uh, zero. So the moment here, here's your joint, here's this uh, weight times the distance, that's got to be counteracted by the muscle force and there, okay? So you've got two, mo two moments around the joint that have to balance each other. And that simple equation uh, lets, lets you uh, make some interesting calculations. So, um, for example, we can think about how much force the bicep has to exert to hold up uh, a 10 Newton weight. And it turns out it's 50 Newtons with this simple calculation. So there's a five to one mechanical disadvantage that's set by anatomical constraints. Uh, and um, you can do additional calculations as well. You can figure out the net uh, direction of the muscle force and so on. That's a kind of very simple calculation, but that's the basis of a lot of uh, calculation that you'll do in designing uh, treatment plans for people who have uh, uh, spastic uh, gait or abnormal uh, movement. And that's illustrated here. So people who have uh, cerebral palsy, for example, will often have uh, abnormal um, movies in the next slide, but people in, uh, who have uh, cerebral palsy will have abnormal uh, gait. They'll have something called a crouch gait, uh, where due to, it's due to slightly overactive uh, 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 central nervous system commands. And this creates some of the abnormalities. And so you might think, okay, well, maybe we can uh, devise a, a strategy, maybe a surgical strategy. Maybe we can uh, 
uh, lengthen or shorten a tendon and allow them to, to stand up in, in a more normal uh, type gait. But that turns out to be incredibly complicated. You can't uh, uh, just do that. You have to actually think about and model the whole multi-joint uh, system. And so we'll talk about that a little bit too. Uh, there are people uh, who actively work on that. Of course, it's highly coupled to reflexes and feedback control as well. Uh, so you can't just come in with a, a plan that doesn't take that into account. There are also, uh, you know, questions of, of the passive properties of muscles. So there's this passive spring-like component that uh, muscles have that's largely due to this titan protein that uh, acts as a, uh, uh, setting the, the spring constant of the, of the muscle. You have to take that into consideration too. You have to model detailed uh, geometry, and so people use uh, computational mechanics um, to uh, represent the geometry of muscles and bones and compute length, velocities, and moment arms of muscles. And so the DELP lab here at Stanford is really a leader in, in that front. And then finally, you model the dynamics, uh, the accelerations and velocities that arise from, from muscle forces. We don't get into uh, much of that there, but if this is something that interests you, you know, I think in, in, our, in this course here, we just want you to be able to understand the mechanical uh, disadvantages that muscles are at. Uh, but if, if you're interested in more detail, there's a lot you can do. This is also, all this is very useful in uh, many fields of endeavor. Uh, people who've uh, studied um, computational uh, models of, of multi-joint dynamics use the same uh, basic uh, uh, imaging systems that were used to help create uh, the computer-generated uh, Gollum and the Lord of the Rings. Uh, basically putting multiple sensors on people that can be tracked and that is data that can be then synthesized uh, computationally and, and used to help create uh, models. So uh, big, uh, some of these are very big data problems as well. If you're executing a complex movement and you have high temporal resolution, you're getting into uh, you know, gigabytes or even terabytes of, of data. <clears throat> 